Today I'm talking to Daniel Hannan, who's a Conservative member of the European Parliament, who's vowed to bring his Euroscepticism to the heart of Brussels. Mr Hannan, thanks for talking to us. Now, apparently doing the rounds in Brussels is a popular joke, which says that if the European Union was a country applying to join itself, it would be rejected for not being democratic enough. It's an amazing thing. and. We've stopped being amazed by it simply because of familiarity, but we should be shocked by it, that the only body that can propose new legislation in the European Union is the unelected European Commission. You know, if any country were run like that, if supreme power were wielded by 27 people who were immune to the ballot box, that would be regarded as an outrage. And yet the, the people who talk most fervently about turning the EU into something like a superstate are remarkably relaxed about the undemocratic nature of it. And from that basic lack of democracy, you get the contempt for popular opinion, you get the way it swats aside referendum results if they go the wrong way, you get the sense that public opinion is an obstacle to overcome rather than a reason to change direction. It is an extraordinary and sad paradox that 27 countries, each of them a liberal parliamentary democracy in its own right, have come together and accepted a system that would make Zimbabwe look democratic. And how did that happen exactly? Was it this kind of creeping takeover by technocrats? I think the origins actually go back to the very beginning of the European Union. The founding fathers had had a very mixed experience of democracy, especially of the uh, referendum, plebiscitary kind of democracy that had existed in the 1930s. Uh, they saw democracy as I won't go so far as to say they were anti-democratic, but they saw it as a potentially dangerous force that could lead to demagoguery, to fascism, to war. And so they were quite open about deliberately vesting supreme power in the hands of wise, technocratic experts who wouldn't have to worry about public opinion, who'd be able to take the tough decisions. And of course, you know, there is no such person as the wise, disinterested expert. They all have their prejudices, they all have their assumptions, and freed from the constraints of public opinion, they were able to get on with creating uh, an almost autocratic system, which has stayed in large measure in place to this day, which is why, you know, when people vote against it, that is seen as the beginning of the argument, rather than as, as it would be in a proper democracy, the, the end of the argument. You've recently released a book under the title A Doomed Marriage, which is about the relationship between the EU and the UK. Why did you decide to yes, call so it Yes, the that? subtitle is uh, Britain and Europe. It's not a, it's not a, a, a marriage uh, no, guidance I... uh, piece. Although, well, it's an interesting one. I read the review of a work by a marriage guidance counsellor. I didn't read the book, but, I, but the review said something fascinating. Uh, it said that a relationship can take a lot of arguing that rows are not a bad thing, because if you're arguing with your husband or wife, it suggests that you care enough about his or her view that you want to change it. It's when the rows give way to contempt, when the stormy sessions fall silent and give way to scorn, that the relationship is over. And I think something similar has happened even in the time that I've been an MEP. When I was first elected, constituents would write to me very angrily and say, outrageous that the budget is, is unapproved, outrageous that all the money is being spent on, on these agricultural and foreign aid boondoggles, outrageous that the system is so undemocratic. And now, what you get much more often is a kind of, yeah, well, what do you expect? The whole system is rotten. And that's when you realise that the marriage is over. And I think it's just a question of time and how we, how we negotiate the most amicable divorce. You've even gone as far as to call the relationship between Eurocrats and ordinary voters abusive. Yes, in the sense that the ordinary voter, if you like, well, the voter, I mean, we're not the, the ordinary voter, the, the voter is seen as an inconvenience, is seen as a problem. You know, When I uh, think back to the way in which the French and Dutch referendums were greeted six years ago, every single speaker, with two exceptions in the, in the entire European Parliament, stood up to say, how do we get around this problem? You know, why did they get it wrong? How do we, how do we re-educate voters? You know, I, I, and I, I was reminded of those, that, that eerie poem by Bertolt Brecht where he says, wouldn't it therefore be easier to dissolve the people and elect another in their place? You know, the, the, it didn't occur to anybody that the people had spoken and that therefore the politicians should listen. Talk to me about your assertion that it was Brussels-backed coups that toppled uh, George Papandreou in Greece and Silvio Berlusconi in Italy. What proof do you have of that? Well, in two countries, a, an elected prime minister 
was removed from office and replaced with a technocrat who had never stood for office in his life. Not just a technocrat, but a Eurocrat. Uh, in Greece, it was the former head of the, Euro uh, the former vice president of the European Central Bank. In Italy, it was a former European commissioner, Mario Monti, who, as well as appointing himself prime minister, appointed himself finance minister giving a whole new meaning to the phrase the full Monty, and didn't have a single elected, doesn't have a single elected politician in the Italian government. Now, both in the case of the Papadimos administration in Greece and the Monti administration in Italy, we were told that these were national governments. That was the phrase used. And yet, the whole purpose of these governments was to push through a program that would be rejected by the nation in a general election. So if you like, the, 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 the last shreds of pretense were, were shed. The, the velvet glove was taken off and the iron fist underneath was unsheathed. You then had what was always implicit but is now explicit, which is apparatchiks in Brussels ruling directly through apparatchiks in Rome and in Athens, with the people and their elected representatives cut out altogether. I saw last week that Mario Monti said he might seek a second term. I don't remember him seeking a first. From your description, it sounds terrifyingly easy for Brussels to do that. What steps do Eurocrats have to take? These were civilian junters. Okay. It is true that the letter of constitutional propriety was observed in the sense that the parliament, in both cases, endorsed the new government. That's the case with every dictatorship. Starting from Napoleon, they always managed to get the parliamentary vote in their favour. The reality is that we're dealing with administrations that have been imposed on countries because keeping those countries in the euro was thought to be more important than allowing them to vote for the policies they wanted. We do appear to be drawing nearer to a referendum on whether the UK should stay in the European Union. What would it take, do you think, for the government to take that final step? Well, politicians, in my experience, feel the heat before they see the light. I don't think any political party likes referendums, to be honest, because politicians are instinctively mistrustful of a process whose outcome they can't control. Nonetheless, they all see that there is big public demand. People want to be consulted. They feel that it's a huge issue. What, what country do you want to belong to? Uh, and that it's insulting and wrong not to allow people the referendum, which all three parties were recently promising and all three have managed to draw back from. I'll go so far as to say that the party which gets there first will probably win the next election. Yeah. The, uh, the people who feel strongly about this may be a minority, but they are not an insignificant minority. And it's a vote-determining issue for a, a chunk of the electorate. Uh, and so it's almost, I suppose, like a kind of game theory, like a prisoner's dilemma. Neither party desperately wants a referendum, but neither can afford to let the other get there first. What kind of referendum do you support? A simple in or out or a more complex construct? I think ultimately there will have to be an in-out referendum. I think it's the only one that makes sense. You can't offer people something that you haven't yet negotiated or something that isn't in your gift to deliver. I mean, if, if you had a referendum that said, wouldn't it be great if we opted out of all the following areas but r remained in the free market? Well, you've no idea whether the EU is going to give you that. And so you, that, that's a meaningless question, unless the renegotiation has already been completed by then. And that's how I think it, it, it should happen. Let me be as, as generous as I can to the people who want to stay in and as fair about this as I can. If the problem is timing and... Uh, what is going to emerge from the Eurozone crisis, because that's what we're told. No one now admits to being against a referendum in principle. What they're, what they're now saying is now isn't the right time, we've got to see what emerges. Fine. If that's the case, then pre-announce now and pre-legislate now for a referendum to take place in, let's say, 2016. Okay? That's plenty of time. You've then got four years, you supporters of membership, to come back with a deal that you reckon you can sell to the British people. And the fact that you've pre-announced that referendum means that all of the other member states also understand that if you don't get the deal that you can sell to the country, the alternative is that we leave and we negotiate something differently from the outside. I think if you did that, then it is even possible that you could succeed in getting something along the lines of a Swiss deal without calling it leaving. I mean, it, it then becomes a presentational question whether you call it associate membership or whatever. Right? But what is absolutely certain is that if our own civil servants, and if the other member states do not understand that it's either a renegotiation or exit, there will be no significant improvement in our terms of membership. The result of a referendum is by no means a done deal though, is it? What if people vote to remain in the EU, or perhaps worse still, if they don't vote at all, as has happened in the past in European elections? I have absolutely no idea how people would vote. I mean, having just been excoriating the European Union 
for its lack of democracy, it would then be rather hypocritical of me to say, well, I only want a referendum if I think I'm going to win it. You know, the, the, the point is, almost everybody in public life approaches this question by guessing at the outcome and then trying to work back, you know, okay, if, 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 if you think people are going to vote to stay in and you want to stay in, you're for it. You know, surely somebody should stand back and say, is this right in principle? On an issue of this magnitude, isn't it just the right thing to do to let the country decide? I mean, if we, if we pestered everybody with a vote on the precise method by which they return their members of parliament, how can we now turn around and say that they're not allowed to vote on whether those members of parliament get to run the country? What about what all three parties are saying at the moment, which is, you know, we've got this crisis going on, our main priority should be to reduce the deficit, we don't have the time or the inclination now to talk about having an EU referendum. Yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it? We were told for 20 years that now was not the right time for a referendum because Europe wasn't an issue. And now we're told, no, it's the wrong time because Europe is an issue. You know, the, the Eurozone crisis and all this. I mean, it's the ultimate yes minister argument. You know, perfectly good idea in principle, minister, but perhaps now is not the most propitious occasion. If not now, when? You know, uh, the Eurozone crisis has wrecked the premise on which we joined. It's falsified our membership terms. Europe is collapsing as a share of our exports. The rest of the world is increasing almost by the minute as a, a, a share of our trade. You know, the, the, the reason that we went in in the first place in the early 70s, and the argument that has been deployed for nearly 40 years, has now been made redundant by the collapse of the Eurozone economy and the mulish insistence of the Eurozone governments on accelerating all the policies that have created the crisis there. Now is the time for us to raise our eyes to more distant horizons and re-embrace the wider world. Daniel Hannan, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.